I grew up in a, a different world, as many of you did, th than these kids. You know, in the 80s and 90s, that was a time when Michael Jordan was the best basketball player on the planet. I, I grew up in Missouri. We didn't have a uh, professional NBA team, so I wasn't a huge fan of, of professional basketball. We actually didn't have any really good professional teams at the time when I grew up. Um, but it was, it, it was a, a time where you really couldn't escape the influence that he had on the game of basketball and on the culture at large. I remember a ad campaign that highlighted this that was built around the theme, Be Like Mike. You can YouTube, Google, Google that and find a, a YouTube commercial where it, it showed highlights of Michael doing different moves and, and various players of different ages trying to imitate what he did. And, and it even had a, a relatively catchy song that had those lyrics of being like Mike. And it ended with these words. It said, be like Mike, drink Gatorade. <laughs> you know, unfortunately, we all came to realize that it took a lot more than Gatorade to play basketball like Mike. That was one way we could be like him and about the only way. But Michael Jordan did influence a generation of basketball players. You can still see players doing the things that... Michael Jordan did or trying to do those things on the court and as a result of his play and example. You know, he's a reminder of the powerful impact an example can have on others. You know, that's really one of the messages of the book of 1 Thessalonians, the importance of models or examples. You know, we've already seen that the Thessalonian church was a model church. Chapter 1 verse 7 said that they became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. We've seen that Paul and his companions were an example to the Thessalonians. And for us, the, the believers at Thessalonica were imitators of them. If you were with us the last few weeks, you recall that the first chapter focused on Paul's gratitude for the Thessalonians. We saw in the first five verses, Paul expressed gratitude to God for his work in the Thessalonians. And last week we saw verses 6 to 10, which recount God's work through them. How they impacted others as a growing, healthy church. Because they received the word and, and they were devoted disciples who imitated Paul as they were imitating Christ. They, they had a godly example and, and were bold in the, the sounding forth of the gospel really a model for us of what we should strive to be as a church. Well, tonight we come to chapter 2, and, and chapter 2 continues this, this personal section of the letter that is found in the first three chapters, but it, it really shifts from a focus on Paul's gratitude for the Thessalonians to Paul's ministry to the Thessalonians. Now, Paul already mentioned this briefly in chapter 1, but now in the first 12 verses of chapter 2, he elaborates significantly on what that ministry looked like. Tonight we'll only cover the first six verses, but let's read the entire section, chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, as we get the full context. Paul writes this, he says, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain, but after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness." Nor do we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ we might have asserted our authority. But we prove to be gentle among you, as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave towards you believers, just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children. 
so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. This section begins with a summary of Paul's ministry. He says, our coming to you was not in vain. And then you see a variety of specific statements that Paul makes about what characterized his time and interactions there in Thessalonica. But why does Paul spend such significant time recounting or describing his ministry there in Thessalonica? You know, some view these verses primarily as Paul defending himself against those who were attacking him, those who were seeking to undermine his message and ministry by slandering him. And so he defended himself as he did elsewhere in books like 2 Corinthians. And it's certainly the case that probably everywhere Paul went, there were those who were seeking to diminish his influence by levying charges against him either directly or in some more subtle, underhanded ways. It's possible that the Thessalonians themselves may have wondered about Paul's commitment to them as he left pretty abruptly as a result of the persecution there. But there's really nothing in this text to indicate that the primary purpose of this section is to give a defense. Timothy had just returned from visiting them when Paul wrote them this letter and And he would have communicated to them Paul's heart for them, his love for them. And and according to chapter 3, verse 6, Timothy reported that they always think kindly of us. They had a high view of Paul and, and Silas and Timothy. So there doesn't seem to be a pressing need for Paul to defend himself. So what is Paul doing here? Well, instead of Paul defending himself and his companions in this section... He is instead reminding the Thessalonians of their example. He'd already mentioned in chapter 1 verse 5 that they knew what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sakes and and had become imitators of them. And so Paul wants in this section to, to continue to encourage them to follow his example. As they are faithfully seeking to proclaim the gospel, as they're bearing witness for Christ and impacting the regions around them, he wants them to remember and imitate the ministry they had observed when Paul and his companions were there. So Paul describes their ministry to the Thessalonians as a a model for them and for us. So let's consider together a, a portrait of biblical ministry. Pick up in verse 1. He says, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. He's reminding them of what they already know, what they could look back on and remember. And he says, our coming, our, our being with you, our entrance into ministry with you was not in vain. It wasn't empty or worthless. It had substance. It was of critical importance and And it was effective. We came with power such that you were transformed and are now impacting others. It was a a fruitful ministry. Well, why was that true? What was it about their coming that resulted in it not being in vain? How can we have such vital, faithful, biblical, and powerful ministry? Well, there's not some magic answer. You know, there's not some secret method that Paul was going to reveal to them, some secret sauce, as it were, that just made, made such a huge difference. You know, Paul merely reminds them of the simple reality of what they had clearly witnessed in him and his ministry partners. We see in the first six verses that such ministry starts with understanding and imitating the primary commitment of biblical ministry, namely to proclaim the gospel of God. You know, if you look closely at those first six verses of chapter two that we are going to study together tonight, I think there's two things that you immediately notice. One of them is the prominence of the idea of speaking or our speech in those verses. Notice chapter two, he or verse two, he says, um, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you in the midst of much opposition. Verse three, He says, our exhortation, a a means of our speech, does not come from error and purity. Verse 4, we've been entrusted with the gospel, so we speak. Verse 5, we never came with flattering speech, as you know. 
These verses are about what and how and why they spoke, and specifically about speaking or proclaiming the gospel. Again, verse 2, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you what? The gospel of God. In verse 4, just as we've been entrusted with the gospel, so we speak. We'll see this continue even in the the next section. In verse 8, it speaks of how they had imparted to them the gospel. In verse 9, that we proclaim to you the gospel of God. So these verses are clearly about Paul speaking or proclaiming the gospel, the priority that that was. But you also notice in these first six verses how Paul goes to great lengths to speak not only of what they did, speaking the gospel, but also to tell what was not true of their ministry. There's a lot of negatives in these first six verses. He says it, our, our ministry, verse 1, was not in vain. Verse 3, our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of dis- deceit. Verse 5, we never came with flattering speech nor with a pretext for greed, verse 6, nor did we seek glory from men or from others. So Paul's not simply telling us, this is what I did. He's also very clearly expressing the things that he did not do, that were not characteristic of their ministry. Why is that? It's not just that he's giving us a list of things to avoid. I, I think in stating so definitively what both their ministry was and was not, Paul is really driving home what they were committed to. You know, think about something that, it, that it, or what it means to be really committed to something, to be really devoted to it, to have it as a priority. You know, it doesn't mean that you simply kind of do whatever in that area of life, does it? No, you, you know what you will do and you know what you won't and you've thought through the challenges or the temptations or the difficulties that might derail that commitment and you've, you've got a, a steady, steadfast focus and commitment to do certain things and not do others. Think about the commitment to a more healthy diet. How many in this room? No, just kidding. You don't have to tell me. But <laughs> if you are thinking about, you know, I just kind of want to eat better, that's not a commitment. That doesn't reflect those characteristics. But if you really say, I'm committed to a more healthy diet, that doesn't just mean, you know, if I happen to eat healthier foods, that would be nice. You know, if you're committed, you've thought about what you will eat and what you will not eat and why that matters. And you've thought about where you'll be tempted to go overboard and get off track and and how to avoid those things. You may say something to yourself like, I know BJ's has some really healthy salad options, but they also have pizookis that are really good. So I just can't go there because I'll be tempted in that way. That's a commitment. What Paul is demonstrating here in these six verses is not just that it's a good idea to proclaim the gospel. He's communicating a commitment, that this is the, really the core commitment, a primary commitment that he had was to faithfully proclaim the gospel of God. If we're going to model our ministry after Paul's, if we're going to have ministry that's not in vain, that's not empty, It starts with this primary commitment to proclaim the gospel of God. You see, as we'll see, we are ambassadors for Christ. He has entrusted to us his message. And our job is not to to not mess that message up, but to faithfully proclaim it. And when we do so, the gospel, which is the power of God for salvation, saves and transforms sinners, as we've already seen in chapter 1. Well, because the proclamation of the gospel was Paul's primary commitment, we see first he proclaimed it with boldness. Notice verses 1 and 2. He says, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. You recall how... Paul and uh, Silas and Timothy arrived in Thessalonica after having been in Philippi where they suffered and and were mistreated. 
We won't take the time to look back at Acts chapter 16. You can do that on your own time if you wish. But you may recall how they in Philippi had exercised a, a, a demon from a slave girl. Her masters were not happy about that. It was, it was a, a vehicle for them to earn money. And so they brought them before the authorities. And the authorities responded by having them beaten with rods and then putting them in prison before ultimately releasing them and asking them to leave. Now, if you had just been through that kind of a situation, if you faced such mistreatment and hostility, such insults as took place there, and you come into the the next city, how would you be tempted to think? Well, if it was me, I would be thinking, you know, how do we kind of avoid that happening again, right? You you might think, you know, well, let's let's not cast demons out of slave girls anymore. You know, let's, let's rethink a little bit of what was so offensive about the things that we said that riled them up so much. And, and how could we just tone that down or soften that a bit so that maybe things go better the next time? Is that what Paul did? No. Paul didn't do that. He says, in spite of the fact that we had already suffered and been mistreated, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God, not in great situations there either, but amid much opposition. See, it wasn't better in Thessalonica. There was hostility there too, and ultimately they were kicked out of the city there, and they followed them on to the next city. This was the the normal pattern for Paul, and he kept doing it, even though there would be a temptation to silence or a temptation to compromise. Why are we tempted in that way? Well, the reality is we all value our own comfort and our own safety, don't we? You know, in our day, it's maybe not physical comfort and safety as we face very little actual physical persecution like like Paul and his companions did, but we we are tempted to value the safety and comfort of things like our advancement at work. You know, we don't want to ruffle feathers by talking about Christ and his word in a way that could be detrimental to our career advancement or to, to earning more income in those, those ways. Or in our family, we, we value the comfort of peaceful family relationships. We don't want to ruffle feathers by communicating the truth of the gospel in a way that leads to conflict or or with friends or neighbors. Again, we don't want those relationships to become awkward, and so we can be tempted to pull back from the proclamation of the gospel. You know, in this book, Paul does commend living a quiet life and attending to our own business as we seek to behave properly towards outsiders. We'll get there in chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. So we're not called to stir things up needlessly or aggressively, but we're called to speak the truth. Even when it's met with opposition, we're called to be bold in the proclamation of the gospel. But how how do we do that? Well, notice what Paul says in verse 2. He says, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God. They had boldness in our God. It wasn't just in them. It wasn't that they were just naturally bold people who from the time they were young, you know, didn't really care what other people thought of them. This was a boldness that was found in God. Boldness means to to speak honestly or freely, to, to speak frankly or with confidence. When it comes to the truth of God, the message of God, we aren't to hem and haw, we're not to shy away We're to declare it boldly and openly, as as Paul said in chapter 1, verse 5, with full conviction. But this boldness doesn't come from ourselves, it's boldness in God. It's strength that comes from Him through His transforming work in our life and, and the power of the Spirit of God working in us and through us. You know, the fact that our boldness comes from God is why we should pray and ask God for boldness and pray for one another that we would be bold. Paul prayed, asked for that in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 19. He said, And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. Paul knew, I, I'm dependent, I'm, I'm weak, I'm, I'm helpless, I can be tempted to, to not be bold. Pray that God will give me his strength and his boldness to speak with clarity the, the mystery of the gospel. 
He was bold in God. He was dependent on him. And, and notice he says we had the boldness in our God to speak to you. These were real people that he was speaking to. We see later in, in this passage that they were very dear to him. He loved them. And he was keenly aware of what was at stake for those that he would speak to or those that he would not speak to out of fear. You see, they loved others enough to tell them the truth, even if some didn't want to hear it. And that truth is really good news. It's the gospel. It's the good news. You know, we had a parent-child dedication tonight. You know, some things about parenting are glorious and your kids love and appreciate when you give your child that, that birthday cake on their first birthday and they're just so happy to have pure sugar. That's a great thing as a parent, right? But there's a lot of things that as a parent you at least should do for your kids or to your kids that they don't love. I remember one of my, my daughters just hating to have her diaper changed. It was like every time she would kick and scream, like, I don't want you to do this. And it's like, child, this is for your good. The alternative is not a pretty picture. You, you should let me do this. But, uh, and so did I say, well, ah, she doesn't want me to do this. No, we keep doing what is good for our children. You know, we take them to the dentist when they don't like it. We, we discipline them even when they are not excited about that. We take them to the doctor when, when that's not their first choice of what to do. Why do you do those things even though your kids may oppose them? Because you love them and because you know it is for their good. And, and so it is with the proclamation of the gospel. You know, an oncologist gets to tell people things every day they don't want to hear. But they do so. Why? Because they know it's what they need to hear. They had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God, the good news of God, good news that is both from God and about him. It was not their message. It was God's. You know, this is not working up the courage as a a door-to-door -door salesman uh, who, who's trying to go up to somebody's porch and get them to buy a vacuum cleaner or, or sign up for some pest control or something, and you're like, Ooh, I'm not sure they're going to like me. No, this is, a, this is a big deal. This is the gospel from God. This is his message. We represent the King of kings and Lord of lords. This is what Jesus reminded his disciples in the Great Commission when he, he spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of the nations. And He reminded them, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We go not with our own message. We go as ambassadors representing the king, the one with all authority. And we speak knowing he is with us. He is on our side. That's what fuels our boldness as it did Paul. He had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. We must be committed to proclaim the gospel of God with boldness even amid opposition and also secondly with clarity, with clarity or accuracy. Notice verse 3. He says, for our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit. Our exhortation, our, our appeal, our urgent request to you doesn't come from error or impurity or by way of deceit. It's not from error, from some falsehood. What we said, Paul says, was the truth. It was not based in error. You know, some people teach error unintentionally. Certainly, we must guard against this by being diligent students of God's Word to make sure we understand the truth and can communicate that to others as we have opportunity. But many communicate error knowingly because of what they hope to gain. One commentator says, here Paul is not distancing his team from a hypothetical, sincerely mistaken preacher, but from the wily one the one who intentionally communicates a falsehood for what they can gain, as we'll see. That wasn't Paul. He wasn't speaking falsely. He, he wasn't just coming up with a message he thought was, was clever for people to hear. He was speaking the truth of God. And his exhortation didn't come from 
impurity. This is likely not referring so much to the purity of the message, but that of the messenger. Oftentimes this word refers to sexual purity, and it it could be speaking of that here. There were many false teachers who were were teaching things, even pagan religions, that, that were connected to sexual relationships, and they would use their instruction to gain sexual favor. But I I think here it's more likely he's using the word more generally to refer to any improper motivation that would have spurred him to alter the message, as we'll see in the coming verses. And he says our exhortation didn't come by way of deceit. There were no fraudulent claims, no sleight of hand, no effort to manipulate or or shape the message in a way that would get the response that we hoped for. They were not like a a used car salesman, as it were. Now, I I do know there are few used car salesmen with integrity that attend this church. Um, But there's a reason. There's a stereotype, right? Right? You know, that that willingness to tell you whatever you want to hear to close the deal, that wasn't Paul. He was not deceptive in his message. He simply proclaimed the truth with clarity and accuracy. You know, Paul is here really contrasting their ministry with that of the typical traveling religious teacher or philosopher of the day. While some of them did have genuine conviction Many were like most of our modern-day politicians, telling people what they want to hear and changing their message to suit the audience and and to get the response that they desired for the sake of their own gain. You understand, people want to have their ears tickled, 2 Timothy 4.3 says, and, and so if you want to gain power or favor or wealth, you tell people what they want to hear. But biblical leadership and ministry stands on and speaks that which is true with absolute clarity. 2 Corinthians 4.2, Paul said this of his ministry, We have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Paul was not changing the message for a particular response. He was committed to speaking the truth with clarity. So must we be. We must proclaim the true gospel with clarity and accuracy. We do not and cannot change that message, no matter the response. We speak the truth about God, that he is the creator of all things, that he is holy and just, and we are accountable to him We speak the truth about mankind, that we are sinners, rebels against that God, and that our problem is inherent in ourselves. It's not our circumstances or our upbringing. It's our own sinfulness. We speak the truth about Christ, that he's the God-man, born of a virgin, who lived a, a perfect, sinless life and died a death of substitutionary atonement, was raised on the third day and will return again. And We speak the truth about our response to that good news, that we can only be saved by grace through faith, that there's no merit in ourselves, that we cannot earn our salvation. But we must repent and believe the gospel. We must confess Jesus as Lord and believe in him. We do not change that message. We speak it boldly and with clarity and accuracy. And we'll really only do that when we proclaim it, thirdly, with right motives with right motives. Notice verse 4, he says, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. Paul says our motivation first wasn't, uh, uh, was not pleasing men, but God. Their motivation was not pleasing men, but God. They didn't do what they did for the approval of men. You know, this is why so many compromise the message, isn't it? To please people, to to soften it just a little bit so that people will like us a little bit more or so that they will respond in a way that we desire. The reality is biblical leadership and ministry doesn't react to popular opinion or the latest polling data. It's not about pleasing people. Now, Don't misunderstand, this is not a license to be a jerk. This is not Paul saying he never did anything that anyone else wanted him to do. In fact, uh, 
Romans 15, 2, Paul writes, each of us is to please his neighbor for his good to his edification. Even in ministry, it's right and appropriate that we consider those to whom we seek to minister and and do so in a way that's appropriate to them. It's not a cookie-cutter approach. Paul, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 20 and following, how to the Jew I became a Jew that I might win Jews, and those under the law as those under the law, this Um, though not myself being under the law, that I might win those under the law. And and so he concludes, I have become all things to all men, that I may by some means save some. He's not saying you don't show consideration to people. What he's saying is we aren't motivated by the approval of men. We're not desperate to please people, to be well-received, to be well-liked or well-thought of. We're not motivated by pleasing men, but what does he say? By pleasing God. He says, so we speak not as pleasing men, but God. Edmund Heberts writes in his commentary, they rejected any thought of shaping their message in order to be pleasing men, to gain the favorable reaction of the people to whom they preached. When confronted with the choice of pleasing men or pleasing God, their purpose was always to gain God's approval. Why do we strive to please God, not men? Notice the rest of this verse. He says, just as we've been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak. Paul Paul says, we've been tested by God and, and we've been approved by him in order to be entrusted with the gospel. It wasn't so much that there was anything inherent in, in uh, Paul that made him worthy of this, but, but God in his grace said, you are the one who I'm, I'm going to entrust this message to, and to Silas and Timothy, and ultimately to all of us who are believers who know that gospel. This word entrust is actually the same verb that's at times translated to believe or trust. Here it means to entrust in that he was, was to be faithful with what God had given him. God has given us a priceless treasure, the gospel, and we are called to be faithful with that. And, and so God is really our, our boss. He's the owner. He's the one who sets the standard, who has given us this privilege and this responsibility. And as such, he's also the one who evaluates us. Look at the end of verse 4. He says, we are pleasing God who examines our hearts, who who tests our hearts or who approves our hearts. And he's he's not saying here that God is your cardiologist, right? He's the one who runs heart checks on you. No, the the heart is a term for our, our inner man. One Greek lexicon defines it as the center and source of the whole inner life with its thinking, feeling, and volition. He's saying God examines who we really are, our thoughts and our motives, all that is fueling us. You know, Paul really expands on this idea over in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Turn there with me briefly. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, these ideas of being entrusted and being examined by God, he, he in chapter 4 verse 1 says this, he says, let a a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. We've been entrusted with the mysteries of God, with with the truth of his word, his gospel. Verse 2, in this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy or faithful. What is our primary job? It's simply to be faithful with what has been given to us, with what we have been entrusted to. Paul says, but to me it's a very small thing that I may be examined by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even examine myself, for I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted, but the one who examines me is the Lord. He says, you know, what other people think of me, what I even judge of my own my, myself is not what matters. What matters is the Lord. 
Verse 5, therefore do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's heart, and then each man's praise will come to him from God. Because we're just, we're just stewards entrusted with the mysteries of God, and if we are faithful If we love him and we are faithful with what he's given us to do, God knows our motives. And and the encouraging thing, he ends with each man's praise will come to him from God. Not because we've been perfect, but because we've loved him and we sought to please him and we've sought to be faithful with what he has entrusted to us. That's what Paul's saying back in 1 Thessalonians 2. That's what fueled him and what should fuel us. That's why we proclaim the gospel with boldness and clarity, why we don't change the message or shrink from proclaiming it to others, because God has entrusted that to us. It's like if, if one of those parents handed you their child before the child dedication tonight. And it was like 15 minutes before the service, and, and they said, hey, I'm going to go to the bathroom. How many of you would just take that child and set him down somewhere and go on and know, hey, they can come pick him back up. They're not going to go very far. No, you would, you would treasure what had been entrusted to you. You would handle it carefully and faithfully. That's what God's done. He's entrusted it to us, and he calls us to what? To be faithful with that gift and treasure, and he knows our hearts and motives, and as we seek to be faithful, he will one day praise those who faithfully loved and served him. Ultimately, who cares what other people think of you? If your coworkers are offended, or your family members, or your friends, or your neighbors, if that comes as a result of your faithfulness to proclaim the gospel, but God is pleased with you, you have won. You, you have been faithful. That is what should motivate us in that way. Paul says our motivation was not pleasing men, but God. And secondly, he says our motivation was not pursuing personal gain, but Christ's glory. Continue in verse 5. He says, For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ we might have asserted our authority. He says, We never came with flattering speech. What's flattering speech? It's simply telling people what they want to hear, often about themselves. Why do people flatter others? Just so that the other person feels good about themselves? No, it's because there's something they want out of it. They they want something in return. This is what is characteristic of false teachers. Romans 16, 18 says, For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Jesus Christ, but of their own appetites. It's all about what they want. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting in order to get the things that they desire, their own appetites, the things that they want. You see, so much of what is under the umbrella of Christian ministry today is nothing more than telling people what they want to hear for the sake not of the hearer, but for the selfish gain of the speaker. You know, that's really the classic characteristic of false prophets and false teachers. We we don't have time to look at it, but we could look at countless texts in the Old Testament that speak of the false prophets who care not for the people that they teach and speak to, but for themselves and what they can gain. And the false teachers in the New Testament, the same. And Unfortunately, that's what we see all around us in so-called churches and Christian bookstores. This desire to, to speak what is what people want to hear so that those who are speaking it benefit and gain. Think of the prosperity gospel. God wants you to be happy, healthy, and wealthy. What's not to like about that message? And who ends up getting wealthy through that deal? It's the one who is propagating that message. Even seeker-friendly or megachurches where where the, the idea is the more people we can get here, the better, no matter what we have to do or not do or what we tell them. What's better for who? For the, the one who is leading that. So many pop Christian self-help books where people write about what people would want to buy, but they don't really tell them the biblical truth. That wasn't Paul. Paul was not motivated in that way. 
What sort of personal gain is it that people want? Well, Paul tells us here, often it's the accumulation of wealth. He says, we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Flattery here is connected to greed. You know, it was particularly common in Paul's day to flatter those who were wealthy or influential, especially if you were an orator, someone who wanted to make a living by talking to other people. One commentator writes this, he said, obscured from modern eyes are the social and economic implications of their approach to ministry. Principally, they might have tailored their message so as not to affront the rich and powerful. An apostle with the prudence not to cause offense might have attracted patronage, prestige for his message, a a pleasant hall in which to teach it, and a well-earned respite from manual labor. But they decided not to alter the content or the method of their preaching. See, many false teachers are motivated by wealth. They tell people what they want to hear in order to get that. I think we too can prioritize our own financial security or desire for wealth over faithfulness in the ministry opportunities and the proclamation of the gospel. Maybe, again, that's at at work, prioritizing the the proclaiming of truth over promotions instead of, of being so concerned with our own income. Maybe it's in the use of our wealth. We we want to grow our own net worth instead of investing in the proclamation of the gospel, both in our local community and among the nations. That wasn't Paul. He, He wasn't motivated by his own personal gain for the accumulation of wealth, nor was he in it for the adulation or praise of men. Verse 6, he says, nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others. He wasn't motivated by the praise of men. To, to seek glory is, is a familiar word, doxa, to, to, means honor or glory. And, you know, this is similar to the approval of men, but it really goes further. It's not just, I want people to like me, it's I want people to praise me. Paul didn't want people to make much of him, but of Christ. He wasn't motivated by pursuing personal gain, but Christ's glory. We shouldn't want people to make much of us, but of of Christ. Notice what Paul says at the end of this verse. He says, we didn't seek glory, praise from men, either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ, we might have asserted our authority. Paul says here, even though we were apostles plural, if you're thinking about that, you notice that this is talking about Paul and Silas and Timothy. Uh, Apostles is a term that in the the most technical sense is the office of apostle. Of those men, only Paul was officially an apostle. But but it can be a more general term for messenger or an ambassador. So it's possible that Paul is simply referring to them as messengers of the gospel or that he's connecting the other guys kind of under the umbrella of his apostleship. Either way, he says, as apostles of Christ, we might have asserted our authority. This is the idea of, a, of, of asserting our, our weight or our burden. Think of the, the expression we sometimes use as throwing our weight around. He says, as apostles of Christ, we could have thrown our weight around a little bit. We, we could have received praise from men or, or gained some honor or some financial benefit of the position that God had placed us in, but we didn't do that. Why? Well, I think it was because they knew we are apostles, who? Of Christ. They understood this isn't about us. We're not going to do anything, we'll see this next time, that would demean the gospel of Christ or or cause others to question the gospel that that would be personally beneficial for us. We will set that aside gladly so that others will respond and make much of Jesus. You see, they were representatives of Christ. Their position of authority wasn't for their own sake. They were put there by Christ for Christ. You think of a a U.S. ambassador serving in another country. You know, some U.S. ambassadors use their position primarily for their own gain to make much of themselves. You know, they focus on every nice meal they can get from somebody who wants to 
to, to wine and dine them. And every gift they can receive from somebody who wants to, to buy a little bit of their influence or every time they can be honored. Others understand their role is not about them. They focus on representing their nation well and communicating the message of our government leadership and doing nothing to distract from or take away from the honor of their country. Some people in the name of Christ and ministry make much of themselves. It's not biblical ministry. It's not the model that Paul and Silas and Timothy are for us. They give us a portrait of biblical ministry. They're an example for us of the kind of ministry that's not in vain, the kind that is both fruitful and pleasing to the Lord. Such ministry starts with the primary commitment of biblical ministry, proclaiming the gospel of God and doing so with boldness, even when that message is opposed, doing so with clarity, not changing that message at all, regardless of how others think or respond or what we might gain from that, and doing so with right motives, not pleasing men, but God, not for personal gain, but for Christ's glory. May we have that commitment in our lives this week if you are in Christ. Next week, Lord willing, we will continue our study and consider together the parental characteristics of biblical ministry in verses 7 through 12. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the message of the gospel. The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, and you have entrusted that to those of us who know you and love you to proclaim to others. And Lord, we pray that we would be faithful. Lord, don't let us compromise. Don't let us compromise by being silent when we ought to speak. Don't let us compromise by watering down that message for the the sake of not making waves with others. But help us to speak boldly and clearly that message motivated by the desire to please you and to see you exalted. And Lord, for those here tonight who, who don't know you, who this is a foreign idea to them, Lord, I pray that they would come to understand this message of the gospel, the powerful message that, that offers them the gift of salvation, of forgiveness and reconciliation with you, a, a message that will transform their lives, cause them to grow into your image and become faithful ambassadors of you. Lord, do that work tonight by your grace for your glory. May we be faithful this week in the various relationships and circumstances that you place us to be faithful to proclaim your word with boldness and clarity. We love you and thank you in Christ's name. Amen.